Good morning, 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 Zimbabweans. So today I just want us to have a very quick lesson in state capture. We've got this issue that is happening in Zimbabwe with the issue of state capture. And you know what is ironic is this. Zimbabwe's state was captured 20, 25 years, if not 30 years ago already. And a lot of Zimbabweans have got no understanding of how it is that state capture works. And that is the same problem that we're facing here in South Africa, where there is a talk about state capture, about the Guptas, and people believe that this state has been captured by the Guptas without understanding that the state of South Africa was captured way before and not by the Guptas. And this is the problem that we've got in Zimbabwe. You're trying to understand state capture, but you don't look and understand you don't look at and you don't understand the structure of state capture, which always has a few fundamental issues for it to take place. For there to be corruption in the public sphere, for there to be corruption in government, there always has to be a number of factors to make it happen. You need a political class. And usually state capture starts when a nation is formed. State capture usually starts in particularly African countries after liberation. Whenever you've got a liberation group of fighters who come and form government, those people usually have no money. They've got no money, they've got no power, but what they do have is the right to make decisions about who gets access to the resource of the nation and the resource of the state. So that is the power that they have the decision-making power, the ability to give control of the nation's resources, the nation's fiscus to someone else or to private entities. On the other side, you've got what we call the corruptor. The corruptor is usually a business class of people, very wealthy, very powerful. They control industry. They control the banking system. They control the financial system. They control the economy and how it functions. These people are usually known as the corruptors because they've got the money, they've got the power to go and lubricate the government officials, the liberation fighters that have got no money, that are broke, that have no power, that actually don't even have the power to run the economy so they are dependent on this capital class. Now, once you understand this, this is how to begin to understand what state capture is. Now, when Zimbabwe got its independence, when Mugabe and Zano PF came from the bush, they were broke ass. They had no money. And they came into a functional economy that was controlled by a capital class of Rhodesians, Britons, Americans, Australians, and South Africans. Zimbabwe's economy has always traded most with South Africa more than any other country. So Zimbabwe's economy, you might not even realize it, has always been under the control of South African capital. Most of the mines in Zimbabwe, most of the industries in Zimbabwe, most of the organizations that were operating, giving apprenticeships, making Zimbabwe function, they've always been South African. And if they are not South African, they were British. If they were not British, they were American. And I'm trying to make you understand that so we came from independence with a government that had broke people. Not only were they broke government officials, we had broke black Zimbabweans. There were no millionaires among Zimbabweans. And those few millionaires that existed were only millionaires because of the fact that they had been made millionaires by white capital. White capital has been choosing who to make rich in Zimbabwe since the beginning of time. They would choose who they give money or loans to buy buses, who they give loans or money to buy trucks since the beginning of black business in the 1960s and 1970s. And that model came directly from South Africa. So if you want to understand Zimbabwe state capture, you've got to start understanding where our government officials started getting seduced by business so that they can give opportunities and, and resources of the nations to the capital class, to the corruptor. So you've got to understand the corruptee and the corruptor. The corruptee is our government officials who control resources and who can determine who to give those resources to. The corruptor is the business class.
When you start there, you will begin to understand where everything else cascaded from. So, when our government came into government, there had been sanctions on Rhodesia. Those sanctions were impacting fuel and they were impacting resources. Our ability to sell resources to the international community was curtailed by the sanctions that was on Rhodesia. And the structures that were existing in Rhodesia were brought down when the new government came in. They created MMCZ to start marketing our resources to the international community. But when they did that, they brought in a man who was a sanction buster, a white man who had been working for Rhodesia to pass sanctions to come and head up MMCZ and take our minerals to the international community, utilizing the same channels that were utilized during Rhodesia. So what this did is MMCZ, instead of taking our minerals and resources direct to market, they did not do that. They continued to use the brokers that were in Switzerland, the brokers that were in England, utilizing the same sanction-busting mechanisms, but it was a corruption. This corruption therefore created ways and means to start bribing government officials, putting money into their pockets, while still transfer pricing our resources to Switzerland, transfer pricing our resources to Swiss institutions. But the brokers that were being utilized in Switzerland, these brokers that were transfer pricing belonged to two mining companies, Anglo-America and uh, what you call it, uh, Rio Tinto. These institutions have continued to control our mineral marketing in Zimbabwe. And when they were taken out of the equation, you will realize it will coincide with these sanctions and where we are again today. I'll leave that. We then had a sanction busting mechanism that was utilized to buy oil and to buy fuel from South Africa and, and Israel. We used brokers again to make sure that our fuel comes into Zimbabwe without us contravening the sanctions. Rhodesia could not buy fuel directly because of the sanctions that was on Rhodesia. When our government came in, they then created Noxim. When they created Noxim, they understood that sanction busting makes money, and that money that is made through sanction busting can put money into people's pockets. So, the ZANU-PF government comes in. It maintains certain structures of the Rhodesians. Through the business Rhodesians that were there who were the money class, there was no black money class as such. I'm talking there was no black people with international standard money. So when ZANU-PF came in, they formed partnerships with the Anglo-Americas, with the Glen Cause, and with these institutions that were part of the Rhodesian institution that were controlled by either South African business, British business, or the few Rhodesians that were in Zimbabwe. Those were the first people that created the relationship with government. As time went on, it became unfashionable for white people and white companies to face off with government. So there was a need to empower black companies, black people that will become the new face of business that can interface with government. But more importantly, for you to capture a state, you must destroy the fibers of the institutions. The Rhodesians had a fiber and in institutional structure that they had maintained as white people for their own benefit and the pillage of Rhodesia, for the benefit of the British, the South Africans, the Bruderbond, and so forth. But now Mugabe and Zano PF came in with the black elite, with black people, started putting black people in the judiciary, black people in the government, black people in the institutions that can actually control government resources. There was a need to corrupt these institutions. And white people could no longer corrupt these institutions without it looking like colonialism had been maintained. So what happened is they started creating a black middle class that they started empowering, these white people started empowering a black middle class that was going to become the face off with government. But more importantly, it was going to have relationships with politicians and then start to corrupt the institutions of state. Now, once you start looking at it like that, that there was a transfer of, 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 of responsibility from the white elite, from the white business class, and they started creating a black middle class, a black capital class, to start corrupting government and breaking down government institutions, the very first thing you need to start looking at is who are the richest Zimbabweans? 
Because those richest Zimbabweans are rich only because they were empowered by the white capital class that transferred wealth to them for them to vicariously control the government. This is why I say Strive Masiwa and Singai Mutasa were the very first black business people that started to corrupt the government system. They started to break down the structures of state and they started to capture the state. I will explain to you why. So Strive Masiwa comes. When he comes, he's already got government relationships. His relationships were with Joshua Nkomo. His relationship with Joshua Nkomo was so deep that Joshua Nkomo sent him to school. So when he came back to Zimbabwe, his relationship with Joshua Nkomo, Joseph Musika, Edson Zobo, and even Wana Mugabe allowed him to create his company Retrofit. This retrofit allowed him to enter into an institution that was called IBDC. In IBDC, there were all the black businesses, Chiangwa, uh, you name, uh, what's Kasukuere, uh, Strive Masiwa, uh, James Makamba, a lot of these business people who were politically connected. It's important for you to understand that Vana Strive Masiwa were politically connected. They formed IBDC. When they formed IBDC, the very first company that wanted to come in and do real business on a big scale was a telecommunications company called Telesel. And when Telesel came and they wanted to get into Zimbabwe, they had to come through IBDC. And when they came through IBDC, immediately a consortium of politically connected people that included James Makamba and all these guys was created. But they were not the first people to talk cellular networks in Zimbabwe. There was a guy called Kemesi Ziba who had already been talking about creating a cellular network in Zimbabwe. But Kemesi Ziba was not as connected as this cabal of Mazezu. I didn't know that tribalism was a big issue in Zimbabwe, but it was a big issue because there was a Mazezuru cabal that was created to partner with Econet International to start Econet Zimbabwe. Strive was in that group. And the government at that time did not want to give a license. Government has got the right to control the spectrum of the nation. It's part of the resources I'm talking about. And the resource that was in question when it came to telecommunications was the spectrum, was the radio spectrum. That radio spectrum is what these companies wanted from government in order for them to operate a cellular network. Our government didn't want to give a cellular network to a private company. They wanted a cellular network that was going to be run by government. One, because they wanted a monopoly of communication. Why? Because cellular networks record all conversations. They collect all data of all SMSs, all, all cell phone calls are recorded. And that data, that information, and the gateways of actually bringing in that information and taking out that information, our government wanted to control that because it is a source of power and a source of intelligence. So Strive Masiwa went to court and challenged the constitutionality of our government having a monopoly on telecommunication and controlling public spectrum. The courts then said, no, the government has no right to have a monopoly. And the courts made this decision with the judges that were already compromised. The Americans already had lawyers that were in Zimbabwe, lawyers that started to champion people like Strive Masiwa. But it's important for you to understand that Strive Masiwa was in Econet, when he was in, uh, in Telesel, sorry, when he was in Telesel, they were going to create this organi organization that was going to allow government to create its monopoly, but they were then going to beg government through their political connections to start another cellular network that was going to have politically connected Zimbabweans. In here was Joyce Mujuru's husband, it was there, James Makamba, there was uh, a lot of these ministers and the war veterans were in this thing called Telesel with Strive Masiwa. When government refused to give them a license, Strive Masiwa wanted to go to court. The guys in Telesel said, government is our friend. We have formed IBDC, we formed all these black empowerment institutions so that we can have a relationship with government and get government to empower black business. So we cannot take government to court. Let's lobby government. Strive Masiwa already had influence of financers, a capital class, that was saying to him, get out of Telesel, start your own thing, take government to court. Strive Masiwa then got out of Telesel. This political vehicle that they had, he got out. 
because the political power was not working and he decided to go it separately backed up by capital and the capital that was backing up Strive Masiwa was not just local capital but international capital that was interested in Strive Masiwa starting a, a cellular network that was going to control spectrum but not only control spectrum but control the information in Zimbabwe not only that a cellular network is a license to print money and so with that license to print money they could be able to develop Strive Masiwa into the black elite that they need that will have the power to influence government eventually the government then acquiesces to this constitutional challenge so they allow for another network to be brought in. They decided to follow the South African model, where South Africa said there's going to be MTN, which was going to be a, a, a private institution, but there was also going to be a, 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 a Vodafone or Vodacom that was going to be a partnership between private and telecom that was government. So that was going to be the two networks that were going to be given. In Zimbabwe, our government said, we're going to give a private company only one. So we're going to have a bidding process. But that bidding process is only going to Im include Zimbabweans. We only want Zimbabweans to be in it. And if there's any foreign players, they hold 40%, the Zimbabwe holds 60%. So this institution, this bidding process was held. In the bidding process, there were seven companies. Chemist Ziba, this guy who had started cellular network and the talk of cellular network, was in there. Remember, Strive has always said that he brought cellular technology to Zimbabwe. It's a lie. People like Chemist Ziba were talking about it. People like Telesel were talking about it. And there was already a people like Ericsson that had their facilities that were used during the Chogam uh, conference that were already in the country. So that had already made a lot of players want to be in this space. Seven companies bid. In these companies, Telesel, there is Supernet, and there are other five other companies that were backed by real moneyed people. Supernet was Mawere. Mawere at that time was the richest black businessman because he had come from the World Bank. He knew how to do deals. And so he had money. He had 17 companies or 27 companies already at the time, including a bank. So they had a bid. After the bid is done, Strive Masiwa loses. Econet, Telesel wins. After Telesa wins, Strive Masiwa goes to, 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 to um, Joshua Nkomo and he says, I've lost the bid. Joshua Nkomo then says, fine, I'll use my powers to get the adjudication papers. With those adjudication papers, with the, with the legal advice of Edson Jobgo, we are going to go to court and we're going to challenge this bidding process. So they went, Joshua Nkomo used these people, he got the adjudication papers. Already people who were in the process say Stride Masiwa had no money. And because he had no money, his bid was never going to stand a chance to win anyway. But he got the papers and he then went and lied that he had a company already in Botswana called Mascom. He then also lied that Ericsson had sold him its equipment that was being used during Choka. So already there was that and he used that to go to court. But Strive was being backed by very powerful people. He was being backed by Ariston Chambati from uh, uh, TA Holdings. He was being backed by Nkosana Moyo. He was being backed by Americans in capital that was hidden, that was being given to other Zimbabwean business people to give to Strive so that he can go to court. Strive got lawyers from America without money. Retrofit had just failed. Retrofit had, fa had failed to do the electrification of the Reserve Bank. Retrofit had failed to do electrification at Robert Mugabe's house. His business had basically failed to pay its debts because it was a business that was not doing a proper job. So he had to run away from Retrofit and sell his debt to TA, uh, to, 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 to TA Holdings. So TA Holdings had a vested interest to make sure that whatever the strike does next succeeds so that he can pay his debts. So this is when he started getting backing and the first lawyers that he brought in were lawyers from the United States. Those were the lawyers that were going to come and fight because they already knew cellular network laws from the United States that they were going to impose on the government of Zimbabwe. At night, this law firm, these lawyers, these American lawyers were going out to see judges, going out to see lawyers, going out to see the state lawyers and paying bribes and giving promises that these people would have an interest 
in Econet, if Econet was given a license. So when Shrive goes to court, he is challenging the validity of the bidding process. But what is ironic is when the court comes back with a decision, they do not decide that the bidding process was flawed and therefore the bidding process must be redone. They say that the bidding process was done and they give license to, to Strive. When Strive is given a license, the license is supposed to be given to a person and the next day Portras is supposed to collect the fee for the license. But because Portras was already, was already bought by this very same group of American lawyers, Portras gave Strive one year to raise the fee for the license. Yet the terms and conditions that were in the bidding is that the moment you get the bid, you must pay for the license. Besides, the bid was only going to be given to a company that already had guarantees that they could pay for the license. So here the court gave a license that can only be awarded by the government because it is a government resource. It is a government resource which we, the people, have invested into the government. Only the government can give spectrum, but it ended up going to strive because it had corrupted judges and the law system. So here you begin to see the destruction of our institutions of state. You begin to see the degradation of our legal system from the corruption of the state lawyers to the corruption of the, uh, what you call it, the judiciary and corruption of government individuals that became complicit to ensure that Econet gets a license to a spectrum, to a national asset without following procedure or protocol. The court goes over and above its responsibility and its mandate and gives a license that there's no power to give because of political pressure that was in the country at the time. Zimbabwe had just been taken out of the IMF. Zimbabwe had just been suspended from other multilateral lending institutions. Land reform had started. Mugabe was unpopular. And that unpopularity of Mugabe, that unpopularity of the ZANU-PF government gave impetus for the, for the, for the judges and for the, the legal system to, to steamroll through this license to Econet illegally just so that they could get the expedience of creating a company that they could benefit from. So you realize that there was a vested interest in Econet having service, in Econet having a license because of who was backing it that was going to allow all the people that have corrupted the system to get rich. Now let's leave Strive. Let's now go and see what Shingai Mtasa did. So we come into Rhodesia, from Rhodesia into Zimbabwe. There is this old way of bringing in fuel into Zimbabwe, into, into Rhodesia. This time Zimbabwe doesn't have sanctions, so they need a new system. They create Noxim, they put big, huge tanks that can, that, can, that can hold so much fuel to stop the sabotage of sanctions affecting the nation. In come Sasso, in come Glencoe, and all these other resource players. And when we talk Sasso, when we talk Glencoe, we're talking some of the biggest resource traders in the world. So they trade fuel as well. They then have the ships that bring fuel. So these guys come and say, we want to supply this Noxim with fuel. We'll bring fuel directly into Zimbabwe. We will even hold, have holding tanks so that we can just give fuel to the country on consignment. The guys in government that had relationships, the politicians said, no, we don't want your tanks here. We don't want you to give us your fuel directly. We want you to deal with a Zimbabwean who will tell you what you do. The Zimbabwean that was put forward was a man called Shingai Mutasa. The, the, the process of coming up with this company was a tender bidding process. This tender bidding process was again flawed with this corruption, who you know, and Shingai Mutasa got the deal to facilitate and become the middleman between Sasso, Glencore, and all these other companies to bring fuel into the company, country. With this, he then said to Sasso, you will bring in fuel, but before you bring in the fuel, you must leave a certain amount of money in a foreign bank account, an offshore account, as my commission. This is a commission for being a middleman. A middleman that is not necessarily required. But anyway, it happens. Shinga Mtasa is accepted. Sasso is putting money into com as a commission into a particular account sitting offshore. That account is then used to come and bribe the ministers that allowed this deal to happen in the first place, to bribe people at Noxin, and to bribe anybody in the system who must make the system work. Sasso begins to give fuel to Zimbabwe. But that fuel is no longer just fuel cost. 
It's now got the fuel cost plus the commissions that are being paid. So the fuel that is coming into Zimbabwe is more expensive than the fuel that Zimbabweans are supposed to get. That money then is paying bribes. We then hear allegations that Shingai Mutasa started saying that he wants to be involved in bringing this fuel in himself. So he started having trucks that used to go to South Africa, bring in fuel. But what started to happen is this fuel were now coming empty. They go to Onoxim, they charge government, but they've still got that commission and that loaded fee. And eventually he accumulated money. Noxim lost fuel, lost Noxim and the government lost money. And eventually there was no fuel in Noxim. So you've got the creation of this cartel that captured government, captured government resources, captured the fiscus of the nation. And eventually this caused our government and reserve bank to lose foreign currency. And remember, it coincides with strife. It's at a time where we were going, taking land, at a time that we were being suspended from IMF, at a time where Zimbabwe was in problems. Part of those problems were caused by the draining of the economy by people like Strive, like, like, like Shingai Mutas. Now, let's converge it into today. Shingai Mutasa then creates a huge amount of money, a pile of money. Him, his colleagues, his, and they're making all this money from our taxpayers' money. They're making all this money from the reserves of the nation. They're making all this money while sabotaging the fuel system of the nation. Anybody who sabotages the fuel system of the nation is a terrorist, is treasonous. But they were not looked at as treasonous. They were allowed to get rich. They became the two richest black men in Zimbabwe. It is critical for you to understand that corruption and state capture go hand in hand with capital ownership. So there can be no black state capture of Zimbabwe if you are not a capital owner. And this black state capture was facilitated by funders and people in the background who happened to be part of the old system. And this is the system that still prevails today. Today, Sasso can't come to Zimbabwe because Sasso is listed on the US, U.S. Stock Exchange. And because it's listed on the U.S. Stock Exchange, the sanctions are on Zimbabwe. EO 13469 do not allow American companies to uh, uh, invest in Zimbabwe without a license from the U.S. president. So, they now have new players who came into the market. And these new players who came into the market come at a time where Zuba, which belongs to Shingai Mutasa, or at least Masawara Holdings, which is Shingai Mutasa's company, then comes in and Zuba is the second biggest fuel deliverer in Zimbabwe. Followed by, I mean, actually the first one is Total, then there is Zuba. Zuba bought all of the, 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 BP, the, BP, uh, the BP garages. Those BP garages were owned by BP and they were owned by, 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 by Glencoe. Can you see the relationships? The same old white monopoly players that play in South Africa, the same old white monopoly players that are controlling resources on the African continent, the Anglo-Americas, the Glencores, they are still in the picture in Zimbabwe 20, 30 years after independence. This is why I'm saying a capital class has to corrupt the government class. But this white capital class, remember, created a black capital class to bribe and to control Zimbabwe. And that was who? That was Shingai Mutasa and Strive Masiwa. Strive Masiwa to control information. Strive Masiwa to control data. Strive Masiwa to control banking. Because once you are in the cellular network space, you will then go into all these other fourth industrial revolution industries. It was deliberate why these men were created. So, Shingai Mutasa is now providing fuel. He's now in the background. He's now been removed. But by his money that he made, he buys Sable Chemicals, he buys Zimfos, he buys TA Holdings, he buys the Cresta Group of Hotels. He basically controls all that used to be white industry. It is in his hands. He's got a construction company called Costain. He becomes a key player in the economy of Zimbabwe. He becomes so powerful because he's got money to bribe and to manipulate laws and to manipulate judges the same way Strive Masiwa does it. Strive Masiwa then registers Econet. He doesn't have the money to pay for the license. He goes and he goes to the JS, uh, to the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange and decides to list. He cannot list because he doesn't have any record of performance. He cannot list because he's not operating. You need three years financials for you to be able to register on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. Strive Masiwa then gets 
Nigel Chanakira. Nigel Chanakira owns Kingdom Securities. Kingdom Securities say to Stripe, don't worry, we'll register you anyway, even though you don't have financials. But before we can register you, before we can list you on the, on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, we need to look for money. And we're going to get your money from NASA. We're going to get NASA to fund the very first buy, uh, uh, underwriting of the shares of Econet will be given to, by NASA and first mutual life. So basically, they went to look for public money that belongs to people to finance Chinucha Stripe. It had the support of the Kosana Moyos. It had the support of MDC. It had the support of all the big players in the market because it was going to make people rich. So Stripe goes to First Mutual. First Mutual gives money, 160 million, I think, to start listing Econet. They are, they are, they are, they are, they are investing people's monies insurance monies into a company that's got no track record, into a company that does not have any facilities, doesn't even have offices, and does not have base stations. Basically, their money is going to buy those base stations. But at first, at first Mutual Life, there is supposed to be an investment board, a board, an investment committee. That investment committee was excluded. And what happened is the directors of First Mutual Life, in, in, in contravention of corporate governance, decided to give Stripe the money to start this Econet thing. They then jumped to NASA. NASA is, is holding what we call uh, pension funds. They went into those pension funds and asked NASA to put in to the tune of 50 million or 40 million, I'm, I'm, I'm now forgetting the figures, to buy again these Econet shares. NMB, where there was a guy called Patson Simba, was also involved in this corrupt mechanization. After that happens, money is put into, into, into Econet, Econet is able to pay for its license. Now remember, they've prejudiced other players. They've prejudiced six other companies that could have qualified to get the license and could have paid for their license. But those companies were excluded because they were not connected. Those companies were excluded because they did not have government relationships. Those companies were excluded because they didn't control the judiciary. They couldn't even challenge the decision that had been made by the judiciary because the judiciary was so compromised they would never have been heard by the judges. Chijgao Siku, who at that time I think should have been our, um, our what do we call him, what do we, uh, justice minister or something to that extent, or chief justice, that man had been part and parcel of this mechanization. J uh, justice Gabi, who was a white man and a white judge, was part of the people that made the decision in favor of strife. I'm trying to communicate to you that the corruption and destruction of our institutions, the capture of state, happened with Strive and happened with Chingai Mutasa. And it happened in the 90s already. And once these institutions were destroyed by these men, these institutions were now incapable in future to be able to dispense justice and be able to protect the Zimbabwean. But what you must ask yourself is this. Once the Shingai Mutasas and the Stripe Masiwas had destroyed the state and captured the state, are you, do you think that they've relinquished control of that state control? Do you think that Stripe Masiwa and Shingai Mutasa from the 1990s decided to say, oh no, we got what we want, we are no longer capturing the state? Of course not. You will understand why I'm saying that. So now, you've got this Stripe Masiwa, he's been funded by people's funds, he's utilized the system illegally, to get his funds. People go and report to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance convenes a, 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 a committee of people, a commission that is, includes people like Mangoma, includes people like, uh, what's her name, Sibanda, and they start to investigate how Stripe got his money. They go into the investigation, they go to First Mutual Life, they discover that there were irregularities. The moment they discover those irregularities, First Mutual Life board, all of them resign. Nigel Chanakira was one of them. From there, they start going to the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange and asking questions. How did you register this company? There's problems there too. While this is happening, a police officer, a senior police officer who was in Zimbabwe, phones Strive Masiwa and says to Strive Masiwa, Baba, they're coming to pick you up. There is prima facie evidence that you have been involved in fraud and corruption and misrepresentation. It's a very serious charge. They're going to pick you up. So you better leave. Strive Masiwa takes his things. He runs from Zimbabwe. He was not yet interviewed by the commission, and that is part and parcel of the condition of any commission, is you must talk to the accused. Strive leaves. I think uh, in that time, then the commission could not finish its investigation. The Minister of Finance says, bring back the commission report. They take the commission report back to the commission. So this corruption is in the police. 
The police are tipping off criminals and, 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 and criminals are running away. The commission of inquiry doesn't finish. And so we are standing at that point. At this time, Zula is being created. Shinga Mtasa is beginning to do oil in another way where he's no longer a middleman. He's actually been able to use his proceeds of being a middleman to create a chain of, 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 um, of service stations and the supply of fuel in the country. The country is captured. While it is captured, Econet starts to operate. When Econet is operating, they import base stations from outside the country. Every time they import the base stations, they are over-invoiced by Internet Global, which is sitting in Mauritius. In this Internet Global, the biggest, uh, 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 the biggest what you call it, shareholder is SM Masiwa. Is TSM Masiwa. This company over-invoices Zimbabwe. When it over-invoices Zimbabwe, more money than what we need to pay for the base stations goes out. When those base stations come into the country, they are supposed to come in duty-free. In the container that has got these uh, 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 base stations, Masiwa puts other things. He puts solar panels and things that don't allow for duty-free. And he gets these things into Zimbabwe duty-free. When the government is counting, they count and see, but you know, Stripe Masiwa brought in 53,000 base stations. But when we count the base stations in Zimbabwe, Stripe Masiwa has only got 2,500 base stations. So it means that 51,500 other things came into the country without paying duty. Now, the government is now saying just from 2009 to 2013, we're not looking from 2001. From 2009 to 2018, they're saying that Econet might owe anything between 300 million to, five, to 350 million, right? They are lying that they've been bringing brace stations. So this is money owed on, 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 uh, on, on duty. When they overcharge Econet Zimbabwe, the cost for Econet Zimbabwe, the cost of doing business for Econet Zimbabwe, and they don't just charge for base stations, they also charge Econet Zimbabwe for consultation, for management fee, you understand what I mean? All these are overcharged to take money out of Zimbabwe and take it through to Mauritius so that Mauritius and Glo Internet Global can get higher profits. But this also means that Zimbabwe itself makes lower profits. And then when they make lower profits, the, 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 the shareholders of Econet that are in Zimbabwe lose money. The shareholders that are in Zimbabwe don't get high enough dividends and us, the taxpayers, don't get our taxes because Econet's profits are artificially reduced because of the transfer pricing, because of the high management, management uh, uh, consultancy fees and these high uh, 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 fees that are charged by Econet Global and companies outside Zimbabwe that are affiliated to Strive. Strive himself, when he's getting these base stations from Europe, or from China, ZTE and Huawei, they charge him a very small fee. He, he then blows up that fee and charges Econet Global a higher fee so that he can draw again what? That commission that was being drawn by Shingai Mutasa when it came to Sasso. This is the net of corruption where these men suck out money from fellow Zimbabweans, suck out money from the tax system, suck out money from the economy of Zimbabwe for their own benefit and profiteering. That then starts to create the cartels. It starts to create them to be the big money class that the white people intended them to be so that these white people hide behind them. But let me tell you where it's more insidious. Not only are these people enriching themselves to create a capital elite and that pyramid system where only a few people have money to suck everybody else, they are also being utilized to advantage the sanctions that are on Zimbabwe. The cartels that are still in fuel today only exist because of the sanctions that are in Zimbabwe. The Zimbabwean government cannot go direct to the international markets and buy its own oil and fuel. They cannot commission or hire uh, 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 tankers to bring the fuel to Zimbabwe. They cannot have those tankers carrying Zimbabwean fuel coming through the shipping lanes because they'll be blocked by the United States. Petrol is sold in petrodollars. And those petrol dollars must be paid in dollars. Once anything is made in dollars and any transfer is made in dollars, it must go through the U.S. banking system. According to the sanctions that nobody knows, which are the EO 13469, any payment that comes from Zimbabwe or to Zimbabwe through the banking system of America or through the SWIFT payment system can be blocked. Anything that comes from an institution, a company that is owned by the government of Zimbabwe, like Noxim, can be blocked. Those funds can be confiscated. And any bank 
that facilitates any exchange of US dollars or payment from the government of Zimbabwe or its banks can be, can, can be, can be, can be sanctioned as well and can have its assets confiscated internationally. So a British bank that decides to, trans, to allow a transfer from the Zimbabwean government or a Zimbabwean company or a Zimbabwean government company or any listed company, private company that has been put on the sanctions list can have its money confiscated. And if a British bank facilitates the exchange, that bank can become sanctioned, its assets can become confiscated, and it can have penalties. So that's why you saw there were penalties on, the, uh, on Barclays. There were penalties on CBZ. And there were penalties, I think, on... Um, what is that French bank? That bank. Because of facilitating payments for Zimbabwean government companies or Zimbabwean government and transferring those monies to Zimbabwe. So these sanctions allow for cartels to exist, middlemen to exist, right? And it allows the trafiguras to bring us fuel and charge us that fuel at a very high price. So now, these men, strike, Shingai Mutas, are benefiting from sanctions. These sanctions destroy the ecosystem, the infrastructure, the institutions, the government institutions, their ability to investigate cases. It destroys the investigating powers of our institutions. It destroys law and order. It destroys um, law enforcement. And that works to their advantage. Because whenever they've tried to investigate strife, whenever they've tried to investigate Shingai Mutasa, they've always failed because our government does not have the skills does not have the power to send investigators to Mauritius, investigators to England, investigators to these offshore uh, uh, jurisdictions to see what transactions are taking place. They can't even go to Mauritius to see if Econet Global actually has offices in Mauritius or it's just a file that's sitting with an accounting firm. That is what usually happens. There's just a file, there are no offices, but for some reason, all our profits are being declared in Mauritius, and so Zimbabwe gets less tax, and most of the tax is transferred to a jurisdiction like Mauritius. These men, by capturing the state like that, is the reason why we're still having state capture today. Strike Masiwa's company, Econet, needs Forex to be able to buy its base stations. It needs Forex to be able to repatriate these management fees, consultancy fees. And to do that, it has to go and get an allocation from the Reserve Bank because they sell their airtime in Zim dollars. So they go to the Reserve Bank and they demand an allocation, yet they never created Forex. And then they repatriate these funds and Strive is able to get all this money out there. This is very critical for you to understand because Strive Masiwa has built a multi-billion dollar organization outside Zimbabwe. But the only company he had was a company in Zimbabwe in which his company TSM had shareholding. How did he get billions out of Zimbabwe? If he was a shareholder in Econet and Econet was just paying dividends and sometimes not making profits, how did billions leave Zimbabwe? Because even if Stripe was getting dividends, those dividends would have had to stay in Zimbabwe because they are restricted by foreign exchange laws. How did he make those money go to buy him Botswana and go and buy him New Zealand, take him into, into Nigeria? How did he do that? How did the money leave Zimbabwe? It's critical to ask that question because it's part of state capture. And the money leaving Zimbabwe, if Strive has got the second biggest company in the country, collapses your banking system. It means that externalization in the billions is money that could be sitting in a Zimbabwean bank, money that could be reinvested in a Zimbabwean bank that is not being reinvested. If he's taking large amounts of money in foreign currency, illegal, for transfer pricing, that is what makes you run out of Forex. And it's a company that's not generating forex, but it's externalizing forex, lying that it's buying base stations. You need to get it. That's where our state capture starts from. So now people who are saying, no, it's, 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 it's Taguire, they are hiding the true nature of how our foreign currency is leaving the country. You cannot talk about Taguire without telling us how money is buying base stations. These multi-billion rand dollar base stations, how are they being paid for? Who's paying for them? Where's the money coming from? Where's the forex coming from? Do you understand what I mean? And if we're lying that this money is buying base stations when they're not base stations and they're not uh, due to GT free, free, how does this prejudice our tax system and how does that prejudice service delivery in Zimbabwe? On the other hand, let's go and look at Zuva again and look at this 
new uh, 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 cartel that they're talking about. Are you telling me that Shingai Mutasa, who's got the biggest company, second biggest company to provide fuel in Zimbabwe, does not have anything to do with this cartel? If he's the biggest provider of fuel in Zimbabwe after Total, oh, oh, uh, is he not involved in this cartel? His name doesn't come up. Why? Why doesn't his name come up with Tagure? And who is behind this Zuva? Who is behind these cartels that are associated with Trafigura, uh, 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 what you call it, Glencore, and all these other companies providing us fuel? You would discover that there's the Braden camps are behind there. You would discover that the Oppenheimers are there. And when you talk Glencore, you're actually talking uh, uh, Glazenberg, who happens to be South African. Do you understand what I mean? It's, it's deep, ladies and gentlemen. And it's deeper than the people we are being given in our faces. You cannot tell us about state capture without what? Without a capital class. And our capital class consists of the richest man in the country, Stride Masiwa, who is not as rich as the white men like Braden Camp and the guys that own Insco. So, so the question is, how are they involved in this state capture? You cannot tell me that Aguirre, who comes from nowhere, has become richer than these capital elite. You cannot tell me that Shingai Mutasa, who was controlling the fuel system, because of his political contacts, he has all of a sudden relinquished his control of the fuel system, even though Zuba is the second biggest service station and, 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 and energy provider or fuel provider in Zimbabwe. Once you understand what I'm talking about, once you understand the tax evasion, once you understand these men's externalization, you will start to understand what state capture really is. Once you understand that no one can investigate them because they destroyed our investigative uh, uh, wings, they destroyed our judiciary. No one will investig investigate them because people are on their payrolls. Right now, if I say this in Zimbabwe, I'll be arrested and probably disappear. The man who blew the whistle on Econet to say Econet was transfer pricing, Econet was not paying duty, he was a clearing agent for Econet. He died in a car accident. He doesn't exist today. You understand? Now people will say, but car accidents happen. Yes, car accidents happen, but with modern vehicles, car accidents can be made to happen by hacking the computer box. And the computer box is hackable easily by communication between your cell phone and the computer box. So we want to know what happened to Edward Matambanadzo. How, how did he die the moment that he spilled the beans on Econet? What made him die? Were his brakes okay? Did someone tamper with the brakes? Did someone tamper with his computer box? Now, this issue of tempering with computer box is something that is done uniquely by a number of special of secret services in the world. It's done by the Mossad, it's done by the CIA, MI6, and Stride Masiwa has got Israeli bodyguards that he reputes to have been ex-Mossad, that he reputes to have been ex siret Matical. Siret Matical is a special, uh, 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 special um, what do you call it, a special arms division, or shall I say, the special forces of Israel. How does that have to do with Taguire's accident? But remember, when the postmortem is done on Taguire, when uh, uh, the investigations are done on Taguire, they are done by people that are already captured. This, what we have in Zimbabwe, is true state capture. And it goes beyond, way before the Guptas ever existed. And why has this state capture never come into the fore? Because the same people that are making the Guptas a scapegoat in South Africa, are the same people that captured our state when we got independence. Those same people have state captured this state. And in Zimbabwe, the difference between Zimbabwe and South Africa is that they, in fact, it's not the difference, it's actually the same thing. They capture everybody, the media, the, 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 the investigating wings, the judges, chief justices are corrupt. So these people can never be held accountable. But when a person like me speaks, they can take me and drag me through the courts, through their courts. They own these courts. They own the courts in South Africa, they own the courts in Zimbabwe. They can sabotage my vehicle. They've got access to this information because the cell phone data is controlled by Strive Masiwa's company. In South Africa, the cell phone data is controlled by the Oppenheimers and the, and, 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 and the, the Ruperts, who are the same people that are behind some of what's happening in Zimbabwe. Do you see the net? So when we talk Tagure and you're pointing at Tagure and pointing at small people, you're crazy because this thing is bigger than them. It's international at heart. It has everything to do with the link of these sanctions. But now let me bring it to an end to you. Strive Masiwa is beginning to talk publicly. But why is he not in Zimbabwe that Mugabe is gone? 
Tribe Masiwa said he ran away from Zimbabwe because Mugabe wanted to kill him. So why doesn't he go back to Zimbabwe now that Mugabe is not there? His wife is there right now playing around with the cholera issue. He's not there because he's still got a criminal record, I mean a criminal issue and many corruption cases and many people that want to take him to task. And he needs Munangagwa to clear his ground before he can go to Zimbabwe. Strive must see what complains about Mugabe trying to kill him, which is a lie, but yet Tagwire died and we don't know how Tagwire died. This man who talks about corruption and talks that other people are corrupt, he himself is one of the most corrupt people in the country, but no one talks about his corruption. That's why I'm not afraid to speak about his corruption because Strive is very good at saying other people are corrupt. Strive steals billions from Zimbabwe, then he gives us 10 million for cholera, and we now think he's, an, he's, a, he's a god, he's an angel. He's not an angel because he's taken more than a billion dollars out of you. Taken more than a billion dollars out of the shareholders at Econet. Taken more than a billion dollars out of our tax system. So how does he give us 10, 10 million? And we must be grateful for it, yet he's robbing our nation. It's important to understand this. And now this man is gunning for the presidency. He's not coming to Zimbabwe because he wants to do right. He's not coming to Zimbabwe because Mugabe is gone. He has always wanted to talk to Mugabe. He used to go to the UN wanting to speak to Mugabe. He even got people to arrange an accidental meeting at one UN meeting where he would meet Mugabe and talk. But Mugabe hated him because he understood what he stood for. So he refused and he said, Strive, if you want to talk to me, we are Kumba. So Kakumba Taure Kumba. Strive didn't want to come home because he knew his crimes. I'm not talking about things that are not known in the public domain. They are there, but people don't research on Strive because to, to them, he's a god. Now this man wants to be president. This is the plan of the people that put sanctions on Zimbabwe. His boss is at the Rockefeller Foundation. His boss is at the Ford Foundation. His boss is at the Council on Foreign Relations, which is an American foreign policy organization where Strive sits as a director, now wants this man to come and take over power. The strong man of Zimbabwe is gone. Robert Mugabe is gone. And there's a weakling called Emerson Munangagwa who's willing to sell his soul because he has got no principles. Now Strive is gunning for the, for, the, for the throne. He knows that they are weak men and he can get an opportunity. And right now, there's a fight that is brewing between Munangagwa and Chiwenga that Strive Masiwa has everything to do with and he wants to watch them destroy each other and he's going to step in. That's why his wife is on the ground doing all this charity work. The wife of a man that works on a group called AGRA that is, that is, that is, that is commissioned by the, by, by, by the Rockefeller Foundation to destroy the natural seeds of Africa and to make sure that we have hybrids and GMOs that we have to buy every single year. This issue you're seeing in Zimbabwe right now where the seeds are so expensive and our villagers can't buy these seeds. They destroyed our, our villagers' ability to keep the heritage seeds that they used to have from years ago by telling them that they were diseased and forcing them to go and buy seeds from Seedco. And then when they buy seeds from Seedco, then these seeds from Seedco must be bought every single year. And those hybrids, they, you, can, you can use them once or twice or three years, and before you know it, they don't reproduce anymore, forcing you to buy every single year. Yet yeah, that's not how Africans lived before. Strive Masiwa is behind that strategy. That is a Rockefeller strategy to ensure that they've got a monopoly on seed and food. That's the man you are going to see stepping up to be your president. A man that is answerable to the people in the Rockefeller Foundation. A person that serves the interests of the Foreign Council on Foreign Relations, making sure that he is advancing the foreign policy of the United States. So when he says that he wants sanctions gone, he's not telling the truth because his bosses are the ones with sanctions on Zimbabwe. He can speak to them and lobby them quietly in their boardrooms. Why has he never done that? But right now he's making those pronouncements because Nangagwa is saying, show me your loyalty. If you want me to look at you as a person that must come back to Zimbabwe, if I must cover up your sins, if I must cover up your tax issues, you must pledge allegiance to Zimbabwe. Strive is pledging allegiance, but he's got bosses that are the ones that are putting the sanctions on Zimbabwe. And now you've got the people at the Reserve Bank, the one that allocates allocations to companies like Econet, these people at the Reserve Bank that have been bad-mouthed by AC Lemumba and have been fired. Those men and women are said to actually be people with integrity who are trying to close off companies that don't get, that don't create foreign currency from getting foreign currency allocations. 
the people that have been set off at Zimra, Zimra board has been, has been, has been uh, disbanded. And there was a lady there that was called uh, William Bonyongwe and her team were investigating the tax issues with Strife. And now all of a sudden those people have been fired. What happens to the investigation on Strife? And everybody is scared of Strife in Zimbabwe. I had a politician who called me and said, my brother, this person that you are touching is a mafia. You be careful. A politician. And this man purports to be a Christian. Why are people scared of a Christian? Why are people scared that a Christian is going to kill me? What kind of a Christian kills people? What kind of a Christian is associated with fear to this extent? No one asks those questions. But I'm not going to stop speaking. And I'm on record. They must kill me. They must bring a case against me. They must take me to court and let these issues be ventilated in court. Finally, if we are going to end state corruption, we as the civil society of Zimbabwe have got to start creating class actions against companies like these. Class actions which start off with us going to demand information. We have a right in our constitution to get access to information. We want information as to what has been imported ever since MM, uh, uh, Noxim was created. From, from Shingai Mutasa's deals, all the way through to the judgments of Strive Masiwa, all the way through to how, uh, how Strive was able to register Econet, we want information and we want this, the commission report that was in the, uh, in the Ministry of Finance. I will bet you that that report has disappeared. But Trikuida, and after that, we want the government, if, if Econet owes us $3 million, $300 million, and it doesn't want to pay that, and if Econet has been, trans uh, has been externalizing money, then there is a prima facie case for our government to utilize the reconstruction. Uh, uh, of indebtedness act against Econet. They must take it over, they must administer it, and they must make sure that those monies come back to the public. They must get in there and get the paperwork out of Econet for us to see transparently what Econet has been doing. That's the only way we're going to address state capture. And we're going to need to do that with every single company. The civil starting to hold these companies act accountable through the legal system. Now understand this. There's a chance that the legal system won't do what we're asking for, but we must go on record for demanding this information. And if that information doesn't come out, the question is, why can't it come out? Who is blocking it? We've been passive for too long. And these criminals, these captors of state, these gods of Zimbabwe, the ones that everybody treats like they're gods, and they have the nerve to insult those people that are not in business, the nerve to insult those who are not billionaires, that they don't think they don't they got rich off rich off corruption they capture as if they are wearing the reins every other Zimbabwe that's got no money and struggling to create business because they don't have these large big relationships with politicians I've stayed for too long. I wanted to make a message for 30 minutes. I'm late for my meeting. But you guys need to start knowing this information. And those who are worshippers of mine, those of you who worship strike, vilify those of us who are bringing out information just because you worship men with money. You might as well go and bend over for those men for them to sleep with you and give you a percentage. Because that's your nature. You need to look at principle. You need to look at facts much more than you look at the way you just hero worship people. Start investigating what I'm saying. Go and do the research and see if I'm lying. Don't believe me. Look and do the research. And when you get the information, if you admire these people, continue to don't expect to